Right, so um, I'm going to do something a little bit different in this last lecture. We've spent the first three uh, looking at language features and then doing a bit of hacking and demonstration. In this lecture, I'm not going to do any of that hacking and demonstration. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's going on inside Idris. Uh, basically, a, a, an overview of how the type checking works, how elaboration works, uh, things about the internals. Um, obviously, I can't give you full, complete details because this is only going to be an hour. Um, but it is all written down, um, uh, available. If you look at the Idris website, look at the publications page, you'll find some further details. So what I'm going to do is just give you an overview so that you get some idea of what's happening inside. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm telling you this, really, well, two reasons I'm telling you this. Firstly, um, if you want to become you know, good at using any kind of programming language, it's really good to have a little bit of knowledge about what's going on inside, having a little bit of knowledge about the evaluation model, execution, um, uh, how your programs are represented inside. Um, secondly, uh, Idris is very much a research project. Uh, there's a lot of research still to do. We are, we are still learning a lot about how to implement dependently typed programming languages as well as a lot about how to program with them. So the more you know uh, about the internals, the more chance you have of getting involved in that kind of thing. So if it's something that takes you know, your interest, if you're interested in uh, uh, compiler design or uh, code generation, all of these things, then uh, what I'm going to say today will be a, a bit of an introduction for you to um, um, you know, get used to what's going on inside it. Towards the end, I'm going to say a little bit about some possible directions you might want to go, some, some features that I'd like Idris to have, but I know I'm not going to have time to implement. And, and obviously having more people involved in the development effort would be fantastic from my point of view. So uh, what I'm going to talk about firstly is a little bit about what the core language of Idris is. Um, I'm not going to give any real formal details. I just want to give you a, a, an overview. So I'll, I'll, you, you'll get an idea of what uh, internal pro uh, core programs look like. I'll say a bit about how we take Idris high-level programs and turn them into core language programs. And I'll say a little bit about the challenges involved in compiling dependent types above and beyond the challenges that you have in uh, more conventional functional programming languages. So all of this code is available to browse. So you know it's open source, BSD licensed. You're, you're very welcome to uh, you know steal bits of it and fork it and do all kinds of other things with it. And all of that code is available on, on GitHub. Um, I know quite a few of you have already made contributions, for which I thank you. Um, but if more of you can, that's even better. Right. So let's start by talking about. Uh, what the core language of Idris is. So uh, I call this TT. I've always called it TT. There are a lot of um, uh, implementations of type theory out there, you know, calculus of inductive constructions, extended calculus constructions, Chavilo, UTT. Um, you always have to do some um, tweaks and, and, and fiddles to, to, to get these things being exactly the way you want it. So um, uh, I've basically just given it a different name. I've called it TT. So it is. Um, uh, a very simple uh, core language. The, the only things that you can have in TT terms are uh, variables, function applications, and uh, binding forms. So binding forms could be uh, you know, lambdas or uh, function bindings or, or let bindings, and, uh, oh, and, and pattern bindings, which I'll come to in a moment. And you can also have constants. So these are uh, uh, primitive, um, uh, you know, primitive constants, uh, values of primitive types. You can also extend TT with some primitive functions. So there's, you know, uh, addition on integer primitives is, is, is something that's um, a way of extending TT. But, but um, as far as the type checker is concerned, they are just considered functions. They're functions that happen to have an internal implementation, but they're just considered functions. So the only thing that is allowed in TT uh, programs, so we've got TT terms, which just has these variable applications and binders. Um, uh, TT programs only allow top-level data declarations and top-level uh, function definitions. So function definitions consist of uh, clauses in uh, pattern matching clauses. So a left-hand side equals a right-hand side, just a set of those. That's all you have. So you know, no where clauses, no type classes, um, none of that. And every uh, every term in uh, uh, in, in, in a TT program has to be fully explicit. So remember, we've had implicit arguments to functions. We've had uh, you know, quantifying over a type variable or quantifying over a length. None of that is allowed, uh, sorry, implicitly. None of that is allowed in TT. It's got to be completely explicit. This is something that um, once, you've, once you've constructed a TT program, this is something that you could, in theory, feed to a separate external implementation of the language and have some independent system check that your program was okay. In fact, what really happens is uh, there's a type checker 
uh, which is just a very small kernel uh, of, of Idris, just a few hundred lines of code. And when, uh, when the high-level program has been translated into TT, it gets fed to this uh, very small type checker, and uh, the type checker you know, checks that the term that you've actually uh, constructed is something that is, uh, is well-typed. I said here you know, about 500 lines, so that's the type checker and the evaluator. So I've written less chance of errors, and, and I actually thought probably more carefully about that particular line than any other line. So, you know, what exactly do I even mean by errors? Uh, I guess what I'm saying here really is that, the, the, that if, if we work on the assumption that bugs per line of code is, uh, is, is, is a constant rate for any given programmer, uh, the fewer lines of code, uh, the, the, the fewer bugs we're going to have in, in our type checker. I haven't actually changed the type checker for a very long time. I've, I've made some minor changes to improve the efficiency, but I haven't changed anything in that kernel. I, I really avoid, as far as possible, changing things in that kernel. So any, any feature I add to the high-level language has to be explainable in terms of the implementation of TT we already have. And if it isn't, well, uh, something weird happened. Something's gone wrong. So there's an obvious challenge here. You know, we have... We have TT, the very simple core language that we can easily type check, but it's not a language that you want to program in. Uh, and we're going to somehow have to get from our high-level Idris programs into these TT programs so that we can you know, run the things. The only things we're going to run, the only things we're going to compile are TT programs. So um, I'll give you an example of, 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 of how elaboration might work. So when I say elaboration, I'm basically talking about uh, you know, how you take the high-level program, turn it into the low-level representation. So that's what I mean by elaboration. Um, <clears throat> I'll take a high-level um, Idris program, so a high-level data type, a high-level function, and I'll show you what happens to get from that, uh, when you go from that program into TT. So here's uh, vectors. We've seen, we've seen vectors a few times already. Um, so uh, we're all intimately familiar with this data type. We've used it in quite a few of the exercises. Uh, internally, so we can't have, um, so th this A is implicitly quantified over, this K is implicitly quantified over. We can't have an A and a K without them being bound somewhere. We, we, they, they have to, we have to have some explanation of what A and K are. So internally, what this looks like is, well, nil uh, is for all A in type, so quantifying over A, there is a vector of A's of length zero. And then for the cons case, um, for all A in type, for all K of type natural number, we can have an element and a vector of length K. So what we've done is, is, is change these implicit arguments to things that we're explicitly quantifying over. So as a programmer, you never want to have to do this because it's just going to get noisy. In fact, here's an example of how noisy it gets. And uh, I picked a, a, a list with two elements here because any more and it wouldn't fit on one line. Um, so the, the, the list of characters containing A and B, well, that's cons of, well, we better say it's a character, and we better say what the length of the remaining list is, because this length here tells us what the type of, of this list is. Uh, so this is, this is going to be a vector char of suck of zero. And then this one is also a character. Uh, it's, a, it's got length zero, so the length has got smaller. And then we've got the value, and then we've got the, the tail of the list. And this tail also has to say what the... Uh, uh, what the element type is, otherwise, you know, this word type check. So there is a question, yes, David. It's, what about that in itself? Did that not also get a definition? Uh, yes, it did, but uh, it's just the same as this. So there's nothing, okay. there's nothing funny going on uh, with vector because there's no implicit arguments. It actually does just look the same. So that, yes. But it's that's, not a top-level definition, just like nil. And yeah. I was just trying to keep the noise down on the slide. I mean, there's, there's already, we haven't even got very far in elaboration. There's already a lot of noise in, uh, in what this, well, it's not really noise, it's, it's kind of important. But as far as you, uh, you or I are concerned, it's noise. As far as the machine is concerned, this is important to explaining why this is a valid program. Uh, so that's the definition of, uh, of vectors in TT. So what about, uh, what about programs? Well, uh, this program, this pairwise addition of uh, two vectors, so we saw this uh, back at the beginning. Uh, so we've got an implicit A, we've got an implicit N, and we've also got this uh, type class argument. So we'll have to do something about type classes as well, because type classes aren't allowed in TT. Um, <coughs> so this V add, it looks like a, a function of two arguments. Actually, there's three more arguments. There's also A, there's N, and then there's this type class. So as a sketch of what the elaborator is doing when it sees this uh, function, First thing it'll do is it'll say, it'll identify that there are implicit arguments there. So it'll notice 
uh, A and N, it'll, it'll think, okay, I don't know what A and N are. I'd better quantify over them. So remember the, 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 the rule is that um, if there's a lowercase, uh, an identifier that begins with a lowercase letter that is not bound, then you'll add um, implicit quantification. We've also turned this type class argument into an explicit um, uh, data argument. So type classes can just be represented as um, a dictionary of functions, so a record containing the definitions of functions. That's exactly what's happened here. So the numeric type class just turned into a, an actual uh, con uh, concrete argument. So in the definition of VAT, on the left-hand side, I've added these three arguments. So the first two, well, I don't know what they are yet, so I'll just put an underscore to say, well, we're going to have to figure out what this is. For the type class, we just give it a name. And then for all the nils and conses, we have to um, you know, ex expand those to have the implicit, uh, slots for their implicit arguments. So we've got you know, nil of underscore, and we've got cons of underscore, underscore xxs. Um, plus uh, is also, uh, so plus is defined for anything numeric, so we're going to have to fill in its type class argument. So we've got a lot of holes we have to fill in, basically. Before we can actually check this as a TT program, we're going to have to work out what goes in all of these holes. Um, now, the, the way we fill these in is, is, is through a, a unification algorithm. So while we're, while we're elaborating um, uh, the program, we'll look at each subterm and we'll uh, use a unification procedure to work out what these things have to be in order, of, uh, in order for the program to type check. So for each of these underscores, there is only one choice that will make this program uh, uh, okay. So, you know, in, 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 in this case, uh, in the nil case, the only thing uh, that's going to uh, work in the type position is an A. Uh, for the nil case, the only thing that's going to work uh, for a length is a zero. We get this from the definition of nil. We know that nil uh, needs to be a vector of length zero, so unification will fill that in for us. And in the cons case, we know that it has to be a successor, and we know that these vectors have to be one smaller, so there's a K here uh, that's smaller than the successor of K. And then we know that this, this type class is the thing we have to propagate through for addition, and then for the recursive call to vector add, we have to feed in uh, the type, the length, and the class again. So if you read, um, if you read any texts on type theory, programming in type theory, um, this is basically the kind of programs you have to write. You, you have to be fully explicit about everything. And obviously, this is not, uh, this is not something you want real programmers to have to do, because uh, you spend most of your time figuring out exactly what these, uh, what these arguments are. In fact, when I, first, uh, when I was first working on implementing Idris, basically started by implementing the core type theory, and I was having to write programs of this form. And uh, you, as you can probably imagine, it was very easy to make mistakes in, in propagating things through. So it's uh, vital to have that unification procedure to fill it in for you. Um, so we still haven't quite finished, because if you look at these clauses, so V add A, zero, C, nil A, nil A, we've got an A and a C here that uh, don't appear to have any meaning. Uh, so in order to be able to type check this, we're going to have to know what the types of A and C are. So the final step is to make the pattern bindings explicit. So um, as well as lambda for all lead bindings, uh, we have these pattern bindings that essentially they just give a context in which you to, to, to type check a pattern matching term. So while we're elaborating the left-hand side of a pattern match, when we see a variable, we'll just make a note of it and think, well, okay, we're going to have to work out what the type of that is. Now, these, ter these clauses, these two clauses, are rather a lot longer than they were when we started. But these clauses are something that we could reasonably feed into some external procedure uh, and, and, and get type checked. Uh, so there's a bit more to do after this. So we're going to have to turn this into a, a case tree so we can actually run the thing. But um, you, you, you can just think of this as the final definition. We, we, we're, we've written a pattern matching definition, which we can then run. Uh, so is that all making sense so far? Anyone have any questions on, on how that works? I mean, you're all reassured that you don't have to write things like this. Um, and you all believe that this is something that is uh, possible to check by a machine. By, by, it, it's nice that these are checkable by a machine which is much smaller than, uh, than the language itself. But, you know, it's just a tiny percentage of the code of the whole system is in, is in checking these. So <coughs> that's just an ordinary top-level pattern matching function. Uh, plus a type class, plus a couple of implicit arguments. Um, so, in general, Idris programs could contain quite a few high-level constructs that you don't have in TT. So we could have where clauses, 
get our type classes. Um, do notation, we've got uh, uh, with, the with rule, so um, we've got you know, introducing dependent pattern matching, we've got case structures. Uh, pattern matching left, which you uh, may not have seen or you may have independently discovered, which is, so pattern matching left is just where you say, you know, let some pattern equal something else and, and the, the variables will get bound, just like in, uh, in a Haskell pattern matching left. Uh, also, types are, are left locally implicit in quite a lot of places. So um, we need to top-level type declarations on our uh, functions, but we don't really want to uh, um, we don't really want to put type declarations on every binding. So we don't want to have to say you know let x of type something equals something else. We don't want to have a uh, necessarily to have a, a, a type um, annotation everywhere. So locally, types might be implicit. So on a lambda binding, for example, the type might be implicit. Uh, and as far as possible, we want those to be inferred by the machine. So these are, these are all things we have to fill in when we start, uh, start running the programs in TT. So we don't want, to, we don't want the high-level language to be as expressive as possible, but we also want to keep something that's actually translatable into this low-level representation. So everything we add, we have to think about how it turns into this low-level representation. So before, we, uh, before I say anything about how we do that, I'll just make a little observation, which is, um, so uh, I mean, I, I, I've certainly had experience writing programs in, in Coq and writing programs in Agri and Idris. And uh, something I'd observe, uh, not, not necessarily everyone shares this opinion, but um, I find that, that pattern matching, writing pattern matching definitions is a nice convenient abstraction uh, for humans to be able to write programs and for humans to be able to read programs come to that. Uh, so you'd rather write, uh, you'd rather write your uh, pairwise vector addition in a pattern matching style than by in a sort of, in sort of tactic style where you say, you know, uh, inspect X's and then um, make a recursive, you know, check the induction hypothesis to make it a recursive call. On the other hand, tactics are still a convenient abstraction for something. So tactics uh, are found to be a convenient uh, abstraction for building programs by refinement. Um, I'm particularly for building proofs by refinement. So, so if I have a, um, you know, if I, if I have uh, something that says x equals y, and I need to make an x, and I've got a y, then it's much easier, I find, to be able to apply a rewriting tactic than it is to actually write the program that does the rewriting, just because it does the work for me. <clears throat> so, in particular, tactics are uh, a convenient abstraction for explaining programming to a machine. Um, so, it's, 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 I think, easier to. Uh, explain to a machine how to build a program by by running a few tactics in, 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 in sequence than it is to explain to a machine exactly what it means to be a program. Um, so, as a as a typical cock user, you know you'll be a, a typical cock user as opposed to a human normally. But there's no reason why um, I don't mean as opposed to a dog or as opposed to a, <laughs> a, a cat. I mean as opposed to a computer. So, but um, there is there is no reason why. Um, there's no reason why, just because you have tactics, they have to be something that's operated by a human. So it's, uh, in fact, this is something I think in general, is it's, it's well worth writing your program so that the interface is something that's just as easy to be used by a machine as it is to be used by another human, because then you can start writing programs that generate programs. Um, so the idea, therefore, is that um, humans write high-level programs by pattern matching, and then the machine translates that into a TT program by using tactics uh, to build those programs by refinement. So a high-level program is, in some sense, a very high-level tactic that explains how to construct a TT program. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this high-level stru program structure, um, every high-level construct is uh, given an interpretation as a tactic sequence uh, then we check that that tactic sequence has built a program that is, you know, when we erase it, it's equivalent to the one we fed in. So we go from, uh, the elaboration procedure is therefore to go from an Idris term to a TT term uh, by using tactics, by you know, constantly refining the program according to its structure, and then, as a sanity check, to take the resulting TT term, erase it back to the original program, and see if we uh, get back to where we started. Um, right. <coughs> so, um, now I, 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 I thought a lot about how I was going to describe this elaboration process to you. I, I thought, well, should I, 
should I give you exactly the details of what's in the code, or should I, should I give you a sketchy overview, or should I go somewhere in between? I decided in the end it, was, it would be better to just give you an overview of what's going on rather than exactly what all of the details and complications are. So um, it's not, this is just a you know, kind of disclaimer to say that what I'm about to show you is not directly equivalent to what's in the code, but you will, you will recognize it in the code uh, when you see it. So, you know, for example, you know, a, a monad might have lots more things in it, or a function might take a couple of extra arguments just, to, just because, you know, realistic programs always have more complications that the idealized programs that we present in talks and papers uh, can pretend they don't have. Uh, so this is more to show you the structure of elaboration than to show you exactly the details of how it works. So what we have is, um, uh, well, we've encapsulated everything in a monad called elab, so this, this elab monad, uh, it's basically it's a state monad. It, it, all, it, all it has is a proof state, and everything we do updates that proof state. So there's a little bit for managing error as well. So if you think about it in terms of effects, like we were yesterday, it's basically got state and exception as effects. Uh, <clears throat> so what's in the state? Well, there's a proof term, a current proof term. So as we're building a program uh, by refinement, as we're taking a high-level program and turning it into TT, uh, we'll have a, an incomplete proof term as we're going. And hopefully, by the time we get to the end of the refinement, we will have a complete proof term that doesn't have any, uh, any gaps, anything missing. Um, so the proof term I've, uh, noticed, I've noticed here says it includes holes. So, so what exactly are holes? Well, holes are just incomplete parts of the proof term. And the way we've represented holes is just by another form of binder. Uh, so you've got lambda bindings, let bindings, pattern bindings, and whole bindings, so you know, query x dot scope. And uh, there's nothing particularly special about them except for the fact that you can't evaluate them, so you, you, know, you can't run them. Uh, and um, they won't, well, uh, if, you're, if, if the result of elaboration is a program that contains holes in it, well, that will fail the type checker. So if you've, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, have come across the error this week of, of incomplete term. Yeah, a couple of people nodding. So you, you'll see incomplete term, and then there's a, there's a blob, you know, just kind of an underscore that says what's missing. Well, the reason you get that error message is because there is something that the elaborator couldn't figure out because, you know, unification didn't have enough information to fill it in. And that basically means there is still a hole uh, that, that couldn't be solved. Uh, did, did you work that out for yourself when you got that? Or did you? Yeah, sorry, you... Was the distinction between holes and, and, and uh, question marks? Uh, right, so the question mark in uh, user code is a, a sort of global meta variable. So what happens when, it, when, uh, when a question mark turns up is uh, the elaborator says, okay, what type do I need to fill this in? It then makes a top-level function definition uh, applied to everything in scope, and then solving a meta variable is just basically defining that function. So the distinction really is, um, is a presentational one. Uh, it's, it's, um, I found it better not to give uh, users too easy access to, uh, uh, to, to, to holes while, construct, while, while elaborating, but it is still e a nice idea to give users access to holes if you have incomplete programs. Um, so basically all that happens is any time you see a question mark, it's assumed to be a hole that can't be filled in and it's just lifted out to a top level uh, definition. Um, yeah. Right, so we've got a, a current proof term, which is just like an ordinary program, except it might have these uh, holes in it. Um, we also have unsolved unification problems. So uh, this is, um, as, we're, as we're refining a program, we might, we might do, do during type checking and so on, does this thing have the same type as this thing? We might have you know, the, the, the type we're expecting and the type we've got. And it might be, it often happens that that fails. But it only fails because there isn't enough information. Like, so imagine you're trying to unify uh, y with x plus y. Now, obviously, that's wrong, because y and x plus y are different things. But it could be that as you go further in your elaboration, you establish that x equals 0. And as soon as you've established that x equals 0, that unification problem that was previously broken is now solvable. So what we do is we keep track of the unsolved unification problems uh, as an, if another problem gets solved, every time we solve a unification problem, we basically quickly run through the problems we've already got and see if we can make further progress. So 
Uh, ideally, this, this collection of unification problems, by the time we get to the end, is going to be empty. Uh, so when you see an error reported, that means we finished doing elaboration and the set of unification problems was not empty. Uh, so some unification problems fail very quickly. So uh, if it's trying to unify successor with zero, then it doesn't bother postponing that because, you know, successor is never going to unify with zero. But anything that, uh, anything that might be solvable with further information gets added to this list of uh, unsolved unification problems. Um, so we also have the, the current uh, focus, the sub-goal in focus. So um, let's imagine you're, uh, uh, you're, you're writing a program which is simply F applied to two arguments. So what will we do? We'll make an application of F. We'll invent some sub-goal for the first argument. We'll invent some sub-goal for the second argument, and we'll solve them in turn. So we keep a list of uh, the sub-goals still to be solved, and um, we, uh, uh, we keep track of uh, uh, which one is next. Uh, so we'll just work through them in order. I notice the two actor programmers in the corner are, uh, are giggling to each other. I wonder if they've proved bottom again. No? No, they deny not everything? No, fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, and finally, um, uh, we'll have a, a global context. So once you define something, once you define a name, that gets added to some global context, and, and your proof can refer to it later on. So, so um, functions get defined in turn, so it's defined before you use one after the other, and then this global context contains all the things you've defined uh, so far. Uh, so I'm going to show you some um, uh, slightly simplified type signatures of things that are going on inside the elaborator. Um, Something uh, that I find very useful to do in, in any language implementation is to distinguish non-type check terms from type check terms. Uh, so I, raw is a, something which hasn't been type checked yet. It might contain placeholders. It does, con it, so it, it, it does contain sort of expanded implicit arguments, but it hasn't been uh, checked or elaborated yet. Um, <clears throat> a term is uh, something which has been type checked. So if, if type checking succeeds, then a rule will turn into a term. And I find it very useful because terms and types are in the same syntactic uh, class. So, um, so the, 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 we can represent them both the same way. But I do find it very useful to have uh, type as a synonym because then, uh, then there's just something. You can, you can see the meaning of, uh, of, uh, of a function. Uh, on the other hand, you, know, you can understand that these two are the same thing. So there's a few primitive operations that, uh, that we'll find useful in our elaborator monad. So if we've got a raw term, then it would be very useful to be able to check whether that raw term is type correct in the current context. So this checks in the context of uh, the current hole in focus. So we've got a hole in focus, which means we, we're going to have an environment of all the things that are in scope at that point in the term. And it means we have access to all the global definitions. So this function will check that this is well typed, and if it is, it'll return us its term and its type. Um, so this is very often useful uh, if you're checking a, just a name or, or some, simple, some simple term. Uh, we'll also need to normalize things uh, occasionally. So uh, we, we, um, you know, if we've defined, uh, if we have some complicated type, we might want to reduce it to normal form to check it in a particular form. So you know, if, you're, if you're checking that something really is a function, Type, for example, we will need to normalize it. That just takes a term and returns a term. Um, so <laughs> I should mention this because uh, uh, I know at least David has been bitten by this. I spell normalization with a Z, uh, an S, not a Z. Uh, the reason I do that is not because uh, S is the British English spelling. This is, a, this is a common myth. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, they're both correct. The only reason I spell it with an S rather than a Z is because S is definitively wrong in American English. That's, that's all. It's, 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 it's pathetic, really, isn't it? Um, it's to cause trouble for the Americans. Uh, Nicola? Do you have something uh, less uh, aggressive than normal? Yeah, I do, actually. I have a, I have a head normal form function as well, um, So, uh, which actually is, is normally the better thing to do because uh, normalization can go a very long way, uh, you know, can, can take a long time. Um, the, actually, the uh, um, earlier implementations did a lot of normalization. The current implementation tries very hard not to normalize anything unless it really has to, um, because that can, as I'm sure you'll uh, understand, <laughs> get very slow. And it can also break sharing if you're not very careful. So um, you, you, we, we avoid normalizing if, if we possibly can. 
Um, so unification uh, comes up a lot. So we we have uh, oh, I haven't given you a very helpful type here. This, uh, as I say, I, I've simplified this. I've actually oversimplified Unify. So Unify takes two terms, you, uh, checks whether they're whether they can be made the same in the current context. So you know, like we're, if we're unifying uh, x plus y and and uh, and y, then uh, that's going to fail. But if if we establish from some other unification that, or if we then unify x and zero. Um, that can be made to succeed, provided that we make x zero. So, um, what Unify will do is uh, is um, uh, solve those uh, any any meta variables that, uh, that that it can. There's a question. Yeah, I uh, uh, temporarily assume that x will be zero and then leave it as old or something. Uh, can you temporarily assume something? Um, that doesn't happen, I suppose. Well, the trouble is to do uh, to do that if you're so you didn't ask us why and why, you, you, you're saying, can, can we say, well, this could only work if x is zero, so let's guess that. I think in general, that is going to possibly lead to trouble because you're going to have to look at the definition of other functions. So you're kind of trying to work backwards from the definition of the function to what the inputs must be. So in general, I think that is uh, something you can't do. But there might be some situations where, just to increase the power of uh, finding implicit arguments, it might be useful. But no, I, d I don't do that. Um, Unification, uh, as I've implemented, is actually, you know, is pretty dumb. It's just uh, check the normal forms of things, see if see if they see if they are the same if you solve some meta variables. So the only things you're allowed to uh, fill in, the only things unification is allowed to fill in, is uh, is, is holes. So it, it can't just invent a new value for a variable. Um, you know, it, an earlier version had the amusing bug that if you um, if you filled in uh, a value for a variable which wasn't going to unify, it changed it for you. So it fixed your programs for you. Um, I decided that that was in some ways helpful, but in, well, in one way helpful, but in every other way a bad idea. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so actually, um, th th this is a sort of higher level version than what we really have. Um, so this is, this is the version that takes two terms, unifies, and then solves variables. Actually, unification just returns a list of the, 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 the solutions, which it then feeds on to uh, the other unification problems in the context. Um, so it's also, there's, there's, there's all kinds of things in this Elab monad. I won't tell you everything that's in it. But there's all kinds of things you might want to do, like find out what the current goal type is, find out what the current proof term is, find out what holes are still to be solved. So you've got to get the local environment, so return the names and types of things that we have available. So this, for, for example, might be useful. Um, I showed you the trivial tactic, didn't I? I think the, the, the trivial tactic is something that just searches the context for something that, uh, that, that, that matches um, what we want. So the trivial tactic works by calling get env and then just trying everything in the, uh, in, in the, in the, in the list that comes out. Um, it does that because it's, it's, it's quicker than normalizing all of the types to see if they match, because you, know, you just do it, do exactly the same thing. <clears throat> so we've got an elaboration monad with all of these um, operations that do stuff to the proof state. So a, a subset of, uh, of, of those operations um, are uh, tactics. So tactics, you, you've played a little bit with tactics, and we've done you know, intros and rewrite and refine. So internally, uh, everything is built by tactics. It's just a function that updates the proof state. It might update the term. It might solve a sub goal. So changing focus is something it might do. Um, building a term in some way, so you know, adding a binding of some form. So a few we've got here. Focus just moves to a, uh, another sub goal. Claim says, well, I, this introduces a new sub goal. It introduces a goal with this name uh, and this raw type. So if you're uh, doing a function uh, application, you'll just claim names for each of the arguments and their types and work through them. Uh, for all, that introduces a for all binding. Uh, exact says, right, I, I've finished now. I've worked out what this term is going to be, and this is what it is. Uh, apply is a slightly more complex tactic. It's, 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 it's not quite a primitive tactic. It uses some of the other ones. So that, that takes a function and a list of arguments and uh, solves the current uh, sub-goal with uh, a list of the functions applied to its arguments. Uh, and uh, naturally, you can uh, running one tactic on its own is, is, is not going to be that useful. So you want to be able to combine them in various ways. Uh, the, the, the easiest way, uh, just by sequencing them, do notation, so like a proof script, you know, um, 
claim X, then apply F, then apply X. Uh, but also some combinators are useful. So uh, sometimes a little bit of uh, proof search is, is handy, like uh, type path resolution, for example. You might try a few different things while, you, while you're searching for the, the thing that uh, fills in your type path. So this try tactic uh, applies one tactic, and if that doesn't work, it applies a second tactic. And if that doesn't work, well, that's no use. We give up. Uh, also, try all. This is a more generalized version of this. And um, try all just applies every tactic in its list, and exactly one has to succeed. So if more than one succeeds, that's a failure. If none of them succeed, that's a failure. And what this, this is used for is if you have overloaded names, it just, um, well, it tries, it, firstly, it tries to prune the overloaded names by looking at their types. And if there's still a couple left, it says, well, okay, let's just see what happens. And uh, if more than one of them works, then, uh, uh, then you have an error. So that's how type directed overloading works. And so effectively, what we've got now is uh, an elaboration monad that we can use to write proof scripts. Now, I did, I used to call this elab uh, an embedded DSL for, uh, for building uh, programs. Um, and the main reason I don't call it an embedded DSL for building programs is that I, I submitted the, the paper describing this to the JFP, and one of the, one of the referees very reasonably said, um, aren't DSLs usually usable for other problems besides the one you implemented it for? And I thought, well, mm, it's, it's debatable whether this is an embedded DSL that is usable for uh, things that aren't implementing IDRIS programs. I guess it could be. You could change the syntax. But it's really only something for constructing TV programs. So I guess, I guess I'll stop calling it an embedded DSL. But I very much had embedded DSLs in mind when I made it because, you know, like I said the other day, when, uh, when everything, uh, when you're only two with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So uh, I, everything looks like an embedded DSL to me. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples of, of how, um, how you might, how this, how this looks in practice. Um, so uh, I won't go through the whole language, uh, but, the, but the, the, the paper I was referring to, um, so it's now been revised and it's, it's, it's still being refereed, but uh, um, it's something you can download and look at. So uh, if you've got a, a function f applied to some arguments, how are we going to do that? Well, we need to type check f. We need to know that f is well typed. And all, all the time, by the way, every, every, every step of, the, uh, of this process, we know the type we're looking for. So it's type directed. We have a top level type declaration. So we always know, um, we always know we're looking for a particular type. Um, so we'll type check f. Um, in the context of the, you know, the current gold type, and that will yield types for every one of the arguments. So f, f itself will have a, a function type. If it doesn't have a function type, this isn't going to work. Um, so for every argument that comes out, uh, tie i, so i is just representing an index here, we'll, we'll invent a name for it, and we'll run the tactic that, that claims, that basically introduces a sub-goal for that name. Um, so now we've got a load of ends, so we can apply f to them. We've got ends that are well typed. We know they're well typed because we invented the types that the function said it wanted. Um, so that's easy. Um, uh, we can now safely apply f to ends. Um, we might actually get some unification errors here, but by filling in the ends, we'll hopefully uh, resolve them. So if, if for some reason um, there is a relationship between the types of the arguments, it might be that you need the value of one before you can reasonably write down the type of the other. So it is possible that there will be unification errors at this stage. Um, this is why we have a list of unification problems that we hang on to, that, that we might solve later. And then for every argument that is not a placeholder, so something that's not, a, not an underscore, uh, something that we don't expect to infer, we'll focus on the corresponding n, and then we'll elaborate the argument. Now, if we're still left with, uh, with metavariables at this stage, if we're still left with placeholders, well, we're going to have to hope that they're filled in somewhere else, that some other part of the process can, can fill those in. Um, uh, if, this, if, if we don't have enough information, well, that's, that's where you're going to get this uh, uh, incomplete term error. So, does that process seem reasonable for type checking a function application? Now, when, when, you've, um, when you've got a, a set of tactics that basically allow you to construct programs, it makes this elaboration process really easy because you know, it sounds like, well, clearly to type check an application, you type check the function, then you type the argument. What could be, what could be simpler? Um, but so, yeah, I've mentioned this complication. Elaborating an argument could affect the type of, uh, of other arguments. So, um, you know, applying, 
So applying uh, vector cons, you know, the, the, the length argument is going to affect the type of the, the, the tail argument. Uh, so we've got an append function, say, just as an example. Um, so three implicit arguments, a, n, and m. So here we are, a, n, and m. Uh, and if we're going to build an application of append to two arguments, so this is the, the high-level Idris application, well, we're going to have to claim types for each of the arguments. So we'll, make, we'll invent types for a, n, and m. We'll invent types for x's and y's. So uh, I've actually, um, th th these vector a, n, we're actually going to have to uh, call the elaborator recursively for these. Um, but I didn't want to write the whole thing down because it would have been far too much. Uh, so we'll claim types for x's and y's. And then we can apply this function plus plus to all of the arguments. So we're going to have to work out what a, n, m, x, and y are, but uh, for now we can build the application and, and see if we can make progress. Um, so next thing we do, a, n, and m, well, they're, uh, they're placeholder arguments. They're implicit arguments. We'll have to fill them in. So the next thing we do is just focus on x's and recursively elaborate this argument. Then we'll focus on y's and recursively elaborate the other argument. And with any luck, the process of elaborating this argument and this argument will be enough information for us to get a, n, and m. Uh, of course, it will be because this is going to give us 0 for n, and this is going to give us um, int and 2, int for a and 2 for m, uh, just during the process of elaborating it. So that's, um, well, this is a specific example, but it's, it's, it's not far off what the code for a function uh, uh, elaboration actually looks like. Um, so, that's function applications. Uh, bindings, they're not really any more complicated. So, say so you've got something of this form, x, x of type s goes to t. Well, we better check that we're looking for a type. If we're not looking for a type, then uh, a, a function type is not going to work. So, we'll tell it it's a type. Then we'll make a, we'll invent a hole for s. So, s had better be a type as well. Um, so, we claim that, that, that s has type type. Um, I kind of glossed over the universe hierarchy as well here. So type actually has type type 1, type 1 has type type 2. Uh, what really happens uh, internally is that we work out the constraints between the universe levels and then feed them off to a solver that looks for cycles. Um, so um, we have cumulative universes, if that means <coughs> anything to you. If not, don't worry. I don't want to go into it here. Um, <coughs> so uh, we've, we've, we've invented some whole S. Then we'll make a binder, x of type s, and the next thing to do is just elaborate s and t recursively, and we'll uh, hopefully get uh, a valid type. Uh, so to build uh, this application, just claim some uh, s in type, make the binder, uh, focus on that type and elaborate nat, and then, well, the next hole is going to be the scope of the binding, so let's just elaborate it. There are, once we've elaborated uh, terms, we're going to have to elaborate declarations. So we have sort of two levels here. We have terms which are just TT values, and then we have um, programs which are sort of pattern matching definitions, data declarations. So Elab is the monad that builds uh, terms. Run Elab, well, this is, a, this is a, a, an outer monad called Idris. This is the kitchen sink, everything that we need to elaborate programs monad. Um, so to run the elaborator, we get uh, take give it a name and a uh, and some type. So this starts up uh, th this starts up the type directed elaboration process. We give it a tactic. So this tactic is probably going to be some giant tactic that describes the entire program. And uh, if we're lucky, that will come out with um, something in our atom on that. So you'll notice that elaboration is type directed. Uh, we've got an Idris monad that uh, encapsulates all all of the state that we have in the system. Um, oh, yeah, I should draw attention to this pattern argument because things are slightly different depending on whether we're on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of a pattern match. On the left-hand side of a pattern match, um, we might be introducing new names. So there's going to be pattern variables, so we're going to have to know that we treat them specially. On the right-hand side of a pattern match, we're not allowed to introduce new names. We're only allowed to use names that we already got. So this, this pattern argument uh, just says how to how to deal with uh, names that we haven't come across yet. Uh, so yeah, on the left-hand side, just, just make a pattern binding. <clears throat> so, so 
for top level declarations, everything has got to be of this form, uh, a function type, uh, an application. Uh, so to uh, run that, we'll uh, elaborate the type, add f to the context. Once we've got f in the context, we can elaborate the left-hand side and any outer scope names, we'll just assume they're pattern variables. There's a little bit of a, a difficulty here, actually. You might wonder how, on the left-hand side, we can be type directors, since we can't possibly, we, we, we know the type of f, but we don't know the type of f in its application. Um, so we actually do a little bit of a, a cheat here. I have a data type called infer, which takes uh, two arguments, a type and a thing. So what, uh, and so we're actually, the, the, the type directed elaboration we're doing here is, is to get, generate something of type infer. And the hope is that this will be simple enough that when we elaborate it, we can fill in the type argument. Um, if you can't do that, well, you have a problem. Um, this, I, th th it's unlikely that this is going to be a problem because we've given the type for f, so we should have enough information. Then on the right-hand side, we just use the type that we inferred for the left-hand side and, and check that they're the same. So all, all we're doing here is, is just calling the elaborator for the left-hand side for the right-hand side. It, it, it's simply a case of elaborating each, each term in its own uh, uh, context. Uh, Nicola? Is uh, no, no that's, uh, there could be uh, patterns of Better. any any kind of uh, there several, several yeah yeah, yeah. There, there are several of these uh, several of these things. Um, so um, functions with where blocks get a bit more awkward because where blocks aren't allowed in TT, so we'll have to think about how to deal with that. Um, so what do we do? Well, elaborate the left-hand side of f just as before. That gives us all the pattern variables. So that tells us everything that is going to be in scope when we elaborate the where block. So now we, we have all the information, we just sort of need to seed the elaborator with that information. So we'll lift those auxiliary definitions, so f orcs and any others you might have, to the top level, just adding the pattern variables from the left-hand side in, in the order that we need to have them in order to maintain them uh, type correctness. Uh, and then we'll elaborate those auxiliary definitions and uh, elaborate the right-hand side of f like normal. So all we're really doing is, is lifting this out to the top level before we type check it. Um, so uh, there's quite a lot of uh, annoying code there to deal with, you know, name shadowing in, in the where block and uh, uh, inventing uh, appropriate names for this auxiliary definition. But really, all you're doing is adding the arguments and elaborating as normal. Uh, so type classes, I'll show you how they work. Um, again, you have to work out how to turn them into data declarations and top-level function declarations. So given a type class like this, well, really this is just a record containing whatever the show function is. And then this instance is, is defining a specific show function. So that translates more or less directly into this uh, data declaration and function. So the type class becomes uh, a data type so a record containing one function show, so we've got to give it a name. And then the top level show function, this is this is this is a mistake, this zero greater than. This should be a uh, this should be a minus greater than. Um, it's quite hard to cut and paste this stuff because it looks really ugly when it comes out of the system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, it, we've got a top level function that when you call show, this is just the function you call. Um, and then the instance is just making a record from the definition that you, you gave it. So, so this, this definition here just gets uh, copied into a definition here, but just di pretty much di directly textually copying. That's, uh, that's all there is to it, really. Um, so actually, type class arguments are, they're implicit arguments too. They're just a special kind of implicit argument. Most implicit arguments will be solved by unification, but type class constraints are going to be solved by a type class resolution procedure. And surprise, surprise, it's a tactic. Um, so we've got a hole that we need to solve somehow. We haven't got a program for it, but we do have some information in the context. We know what type it's supposed to be. And given that type classes are data structures, and given that there should only be one instance of that data structure, all we have to do is look for something anywhere that has the right type. And then if we find something that has the right type, well, we've won. So it starts just by looking for a, a local solution. Like if, if there is a type class parameter being passed to your function, it just uses that. Uh, if it can't find that, it's going to look for globally defined instances. And finding a global 
type class instance might lead to more constraints. So, for example, uh, you've got e uh, sorry uh, orders derived from eek, so you might have some something you need to chase there. Or uh, show of uh, list of a depends on show of a, so you, you'll find show of the list, but then you'll have to carry on searching. Uh, so that might give rise to further constraints, but you just solve them recursively. Um, so this is this is a particularly is a really simple way of resolving uh, resolving type classes. Um, uh, but it gives you uh, basically gives you Haskell 98 style plus uh, uh, plus multiple um, uh, parameters. Right. So that's elaboration. Um, I spent a bit longer than I expected to be talking about elaboration, but uh, if you can if you can cope for another 10 minutes, then I'll uh, I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the compilation uh, problem and and how we tackle it. Um, so uh, I see this kind of uh, this, everyone happy with elaboration? Did that sort of as a it seems reasonable? Good. Um, <coughs> so this this sort of comment is uh, something I see occasionally on various online forums, IRC channels. I occasionally hear it when I'm talking to people at conferences. Uh, I don't remember who said this. They probably don't want me to say it anyway. Uh, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that I picked this one because there's lots of others at the time that this is said. So um, there are also all kinds of issues with the complexity and performance of compiling languages that have dependent types. And every time I say that, I think, hmm, somebody should write a PhD thesis about that. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I did, by the way. So <laughs> this, is what my, uh, this is what my PhD was about. And I, clearly, clearly I'm doing something wrong if people aren't... Uh, uh, aren't aware of this, so you know my my instinctive reaction to this. Is, uh, um, I, I'm not being totally fair here. It, 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 there are also all kinds of issues, is what this person said. There is one issue, uh, which is not all kinds of. It's just one issue, um, and the issue really is type erasure. Um, you've, we've blurred the distinction between terms and types. We we could have. Your values go in types, types go in programs, we compute types. So it's not obvious that there's a distinction. Um, so people often talk of the phase distinction between types and values. In fact, I went to Wikipedia, which, as you remember, is the, uh, the definitive source of all knowledge. And, uh, <laughs> and Wikipedia said, uh, um, uh, the phase distinction, yes, that's the distinction between types and values and, and how they're different. Well, the, the, I think the key word there is phase. What, what, what could phase mean? Well, phase means uh, the sort of the, the point of execution, or the point in the program's lifetime. We have a compilation phase. We have a runtime phase. We don't have a type phase and a value phase. They are kind of syntactic parts of the program. But conventionally, still, uh, it's seen as a separation of types and terms. So, you know, before executing a program, you erase the types, uh, and there is this perceived complexity that. Uh, you can't tell exactly what the types are, um, so we'll have to think. We, you know, we can't we can't just erase them. Um, but yes, it's really a separation of uh, compile time and runtime. And what we're going to do is, rather than re erasing types before running a program, we are going to identify the compile time parts and erase those, which might be values, they might be types, whatever. Um, so obviously that, that distinction is rather harder to make. It, conventionally, you can just look at the, the, you know, the, anything after the colon in the typing judgment and say, right, that's gone. A um, bit more to it than that with dependent types, because as you've seen with these implicit arguments, and you've seen with the definition of, uh, of lists earlier, we had, to, we had the type as part of the term, we had the length as part of the term. I think, well, clearly these, well, these, these shouldn't be necessary when we're running the program. How do I, we identify which of these are, are necessary? <coughs> so, <coughs> Idris achieves this by, well, looking for any value that it can prove is unused, and it's, it's, um, it doesn't go as far as it could at the moment, but it does go, it does go quite a long way. It certainly, as far as I know, it goes further than any other, uh, any other dependently typed language. Um, so, <coughs> it will either uh, erase values which are uh, forced. So, forcing is um, uh, a forced argument is, is, is a constructor argument which can be determined exactly by that constructor's indices. Uh, so in the case of um, uh, nil, for example, you can tell what the type is just by looking at the index of, of the vector. Now, you know that this is going to be OK, because um, that type is going to be in scope somewhere. It, it's basically duplicated. Um, also, collapsing. So collapsing uh, a collapsible data type 
is a data type that, that, that provably only has one inhabitant. Now, this does rely on totality checking, because uh, if you don't do totality checking, then, then every data type has at least one inhabitant called bottom and the other inhabitants. So you need to, you need to do a totality check to make sure that, uh, that bottom is, is, is unavailable to you. Uh, so typically what collapsing will erase is um, equality proofs, uh, predicates, anything that, anything that you've written down to prove some property of your program rather than to be the program itself. So we're looking for non-computational things. Uh, and then once we've done that, uh, the result of forcing and collapsing is typically going to be to remove stuff. So removing stuff is going to have an effect. You know, there's, there's going to be more static analysis we can do after that. So after we've done that, we can erase um, any kind of function and constructor arguments that are still not used. We can say, well, th these were only used in positions where we were never going to inspect them. So, so we can totally erase them from the program. So I'll show you an example of that. Let's go back to good old vectors. Um, always, I always demonstrate things with vectors because, I mean, although, although vectors aren't, aren't exactly every dependent type, uh, they are, the, the, they are you know, an easy one to understand. Um, so here's vectors in TT. So we've got this A, we've got this A and this K. And you can see in the uh, indices of nil, you've got A is zero. So by pattern matching on this A, we can work out what this A has to be. And by pattern matching on this a successor of k in the cons case, we can work out what k has to be. So given that we can pattern match on the indices, rather, uh, rather than pattern matching on, on uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the constructor, we just chuck him away. So we can erase this a, this a, and this k. And we've got a program down here. This is our, this is our vAd that we had earlier. This is our, I've, I've taken away the pattern bindings just because there was too much noise. So this is vAd without pattern bindings. We're going to erase this A, this A, this K, uh, and this A, and this K, and so on. So just throughout, we're going, to re we're going to chuck them away, and we get that. So uh, nil doesn't take any parameters anymore, and cons only takes the head and the tail. Now, if you look in V add, so you might worry. So I said, you know, we, we say we can chuck away anything that's in the indices. You might think, well, that's in the type. So surely that's a problem because it's in the type. Well, because it's in the type, it's also going to be, it's in the type of vect, it's also going to be an argument to any function that uses a vect. So we do actually still have it, but now we only have it in one place, whereas before we had it in at least one place. So this, this recursive call to vAd takes the A, the K, the A and the K from the, the types, but it's okay, we still have the A and the K because they were implicit arguments to vAd. Still, there is a bit further we can go here. Because you will notice that in this clause, this first clause, A is never used. And you'll notice in this second clause, A is only used in this recursive position, and K is only used in this recursive position. So what's going to happen is we eventually get to the base case, and we haven't used it. So why not just get rid of it? Um, so we'll just blot out these arguments. <laughs> and on the right-hand side, any time we call the add, we just replace it with you know, some blob. This is actually compiled to null. Um, so we, we're sure it's not going to be inspected, so we just chuck it away. Yes, question. So how did you decide that you don't use the case? Um, <coughs> it could equally be pattern matching on number and then on the vector. Yeah, but, ah, yes, good question. Um, why would it do that, though? Because we already have enough information to do the pattern matching on the other arguments. So. Effectively, what's happened here is the only, time you, the only way you're ever going to use the K is to do a, pattern ma a match distinction that you already knew how to do from something else. Or, um, and that, that's, that's always going to happen, because you've got different constructors. There, there's, there's different information there. Um, what the compiler actually does is it looks at the possible case trees that it could build and makes sure this is impossible. I don't want to go into the details of how that happens. but. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, actually, it's actually more tricky than I've made it out to be, but not much. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just a little bit annoying. Um, so yes, you can safely erase that because, uh, certainly in this case, uh, that, you know there's nowhere uh, where you can look at it. Um, now, that was, so that was four things. Uh, we've, we've basically, we've actually ended up with the program we first wrote, um, which is quite pleasing. Um, we've done an awful lot of work to get back to where we started, but we know that we've got back to something that is valid, that is, that is correct. 
uh, this is this is why this is you know a good thing to do. Uh, we could have just written this in the first place, but we, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to get it through the type checker. Um, so collapsing is uh, is a step further from this. So this is um, this is a collapsible data type. Um, it's a, the less than or equal predicate on uh, two natural numbers. I said less than. I mean less than or equal. Um, so zero is less than anything. And if we know that n is less than m, then we also know that n plus 1 is less than n plus 1. Now, there is no computational content in this. You can tell everything you need to know about this data type just by looking at the indices. How can you do that? Well, I'll show you. Um, here's a program that uses it. So uh, we've got a minus function that, um, uh, given an x and a y, and a proof, a proof that y is less than or equal to x, so it's now a safe minus. We're, well, we, 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 it has to be a, a, a minus that, that actually leads to some answer. Um, so x minus 0, provided we've got some proof that that was an okay thing to do, is x. And x minus y, provided we've got a proof that that is an okay thing to do, is uh, just, so suck of x minus suck of y is the same as uh, x minus y. But we have to push this proof through uh, and manage it recursively to, to, to show that it's um, uh, you know, a valid, that minus is a valid program to write. So let's do the same analysis on uh, less than or equal as we did on, uh, on vectors. Um, you'll notice that this m is in the type, so we're okay. Uh, this n and this m, they're both in the type, so they can go away. So we've got this. That's, that's the result of the forcing analysis. So this argument's gone here, it's gone here. Uh, so all we have is um, you know, the, the end and then something, the, the, the set case. Um, this is actually looking suspiciously like uh, just a natural number now, actually, isn't it? It's, it's a, a zero and a successor. This is going to be equivalent to uh, whatever n is. So the no however many successor symbols n has, we're going to have uh, that many LTS uh, constructors. So notice that all we have is this recursive argument and, uh, uh, and these indices. Now, I can, we, can, we can tell exactly which, so this correspondence with successor is important. We can tell which of these two constructors it's going to be, not by looking at these constructors, but by looking at this constructor on the index, on the, the first argument to LE. So if it's a zero, it's going to have to be LT zero. If it's a successor, it's going to have to be LT successor. So we don't need to, uh, we don't need to, 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 to distinguish between the constructors. All we're now left with is this recursive argument. And we know, just like our analysis on, on the ad, we know that when we keep, after we finish following this recursive argument, what we're going to get to is finish, the end. So there's no information left in this data type. Everything we had available is, was something we could get from somewhere else. So we just, we just chuck it, the whole thing away. Anytime we see either LT0 or LTS, just chuck it away. So minus now, this is the program you would have written, but you've thrown away the proof that it was, um, you know, it was valid to do it. You know that it's valid to do it because, uh, well, there's no other way. Well, when you type check the program, there's no other way that this could ever have been written. So you don't need to bother checking anymore. You don't need to check at runtime. So that's collapsing. Um, so that's all about phase distinctions. Um, and I have, this is basically the end. I have just a couple of, uh, a couple of things left to say. So um, any more questions on compiling before I, on, on I'll maybe, I'll maybe uh, tell you in a bit more detail about how that finally razor works. Because, you know, if, if, if you get around to running your Agda programs, it might be useful. So. I mean, the edit back is... Uh, yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I know, that, I know it does forcing. I don't know if it goes as far as collapsing. No, it doesn't do collapsing. Yeah. The, the, the trick, by the way, is, is to... Uh, uh, Translate case analysis if you know if you if, if there's only one possibility to direct argument projection, and if you do a direct argument projection, you can do the same uh, the same thing. So basically, the case trees have gone away. Um, anyway, um, so uh, I'll tell you about a couple of undocumented things, and the reason I tell you about these undocumented things is not because this is me documenting them but because you can use these to get some kind of uh, idea of what's going on inside the system, what, what programs actually look like when compiled to TT. So the command at the REPL called uh, DI, stands for debug info, uh, that normally, uh, that does whatever I'm currently working on at the minute, gives you, gives you a dump of, of what's happening. 
Uh, typically, it gives you, uh, so you give it a name as a parameter, and it tells you all the internal details you never wanted to know about uh, a function or a data type. So it tells you in particular whether uh, arguments are forcible or collapsible and which arguments are erasable. So it gives you an idea of what the program actually is that you're compiling. It's also a logging directive. So, so logging is, sent logging is something you can put in your source file. And from that point on, uh, the elaborator will just spit out loads of information about what it's up to. And this means that you can see exactly what, say, exactly what the left-hand side of a pattern match looks like, what the right-hand side looks like. Uh, I use this for uh, debugging purposes, naturally. So whatever this what this gives you is typically, um, you know, you, you get an idea of which bugs I've had to fix, actually, by looking at what the output of logging is. Uh, also, uh, the dump cases compiler flag. So this takes a, a file name as a parameter, and this will give you an output of the case trees that actually get compiled. The thing, the, the, it tells you the program that you're actually running. You can see which things have been erased, for example. Um, you can see um, uh, what the case trees look like, so what it was actually pattern matching on, uh, and so on. So uh, as one additional exercise, if you, if you feel like it, so take the exercises you've done already. So you see there aren't any, there aren't any exercises that are specifically given for today. But uh, uh, as an additional one, if you, have done, if you have got through everything and you're a bit bored, um, it could be instructive to use these features just to uh, see what the internal representations of the programs you've written uh, actually turned out to be. Um, it, it, it does take a, a lot of practice to work out how to read them. Uh, the only reason I know how to read them is that every time I've added a logging, it's been I've specifically been looking for something. Uh, and I tend to keep things in. There's no point in finding it useful to keep them in. Right, so uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll just remind you what we've done. Um, uh, and so you've, you, uh, you know what you've learned. Um, so I've talked a bit about just programming with dependent types, just the, the basics of, of theorem improving, writing predicates, what it means to be a dependently typed program. Um, and then as applications, so, you know, it's uh, for a long time, we kind of felt that dependent types were a solution looking for a problem. Um, you know, it's clearly it's very cool to be able to prove things correctly about your programs, but uh, the question is, who cares? Well, I'm trying to say that you should care if you're interested in extra functional correctness, uh, you know, you know, resource properties of your programs. So this is, this is something that very much interests me, and this is what I've tried to get across to you, that dependent types can be used for that kind of resource tracking problem. Also something more uh, uh, kind of practical, managing side effects is something that, uh, that I found particularly annoying when programming in Haskell. So I thought, well, can we, can we use the power of dependent types to do something about that? So this is what we saw yesterday, basically using dependent types to make more generic libraries, more expressive libraries. Even if you're not writing programs with dependent types, you can uh, take the, the power that the, the type systems give you to write libraries which are more usable for uh, re real application programmers. And then finally today, I've given you uh, an overview of what's happening inside Idris. So if you want to get involved in the project, you hopefully have some vague idea of what the structure of the code is, you know, what the, what the features you need to uh, worry about uh, are. Um, so clearly there's a lot to do. Uh, this is a fairly young language, um, and it's uh, certainly a research project, so there's plenty of research problems to, to tackle. I've just picked a, a few that, uh, that occurred to me um, uh, while I was writing this. Um, so Haskell has this deriving feature for type classes, which is uh, I wouldn't be without. Um, unfortunately, when programming Idris, I am without it. And um, Haskell, uh, the Haskell standard defines it, so it says you have to have it for, you know, certain type classes, you know, show, eek, ord, and so on. Um, and people will occasionally add more, so uh, functor um, is derivable now, and there's, there's a template Haskell library that does all kinds of exciting things, binary. Um, I don't want to hard code deriving for particular type classes, though. I would quite like to work out how to do it nicely, properly, generically. Um, and I haven't worked out how to do that. I've seen solutions for Haskell, um, but, and while they work, I just don't really like them. They're just sort of noisy. Um, so I'd like, if, if someone wants to think about how to do that nicely, that would be, uh, I'd love to see how to do that. Um, so runtime data representation is another thing. Um, so I said uh, the other day that it was possible to, you know, compile NAT to a sensible machine representation. Um, I haven't implemented that yet in this version. And the reason I haven't is, again, I don't want to hard code it for just one data type. So is, you know, can, we, can we find a way of doing it for 
um, natural numbers as well as uh, you know, vect. So a vector of a certain size, you know how much memory you need to allocate. Is, is there a nice generic way of writing down how to do that machine translation? Um, so decisions procedures would be nice. You know, can you write a Presburger arithmetic solver that can do um, you know, n plus m equals m plus n automatically? Uh, is there a framework for, uh, can we make a framework for building that in nicely? Uh, and um, one final thing that would be really nice would be just more tools for supporting programming. The most obvious thing is type-directed editing. So this is something I'm very jealous of in Agda, is the uh, type-directed editing you get through their Emacs mode. So I'd like something like that, but I'd like it to be more generic and not tied to a particular editor. You know, I don't want it to work by generating Emacs Lisp, for example. Um, so it'd be nice to have something like that. Um, and something else that uh, uh, David mentioned this this morning, so it was coincidental that I already suggested this, is something like Hoogle would be fantastic. But just Hoogle is going to be probably not enough. I think there's a lot more to it when the types are potentially uh, quite complex. So uh, I've even keeping a list of these things uh, on the web. So on, on, on the website, there's a help required page that you can uh, take a look at. And I, I try to keep it up to date. So there's things I think of, I tend to stick it on there. And, and so if there's anything there that interests you, it's all the things that I have no intention of doing myself in any, uh, in any reasonable time. So, so you, won't, uh, you won't be stepping on my toes, certainly, by doing any of them. OK, well, that's all. Um, Documentation on the web. Uh, do feel free to join the mailing list. Ask any questions on there. So there's uh, there's quite a few people on there who will be able to answer questions. And also quite an active uh, IRC channel on Freenode. So um, if you have any questions or, or have any interest, then do feel free to join us. Um, but yes, okay. I think we shall stop there. Um, and it's time for some coffee and uh, and more hacking.